True Crime Brewery contains disturbing content related to real life crimes. Medical information is opinion based on facts of a crime and should not be interpreted as medical advice or treatment. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to True Crime Brewery. I'm Jill. And I'm Dick. McKay Everett was the adored only child of Paulette and Carl Everett. The tight-knit family of three lived a comfortable life in an upscale subdivision in Conroe, Texas, a town just a few miles north of Houston. Crime was uncommon in the Everett's neighborhood, but they still took precautions, including the installation of a home security system. Join us at the quiet end for A Killer at the Door, the abduction and murder of McKay Everett. At 12 years old, McKay knew all about stranger danger, but kidnapping by a complete stranger is rare. And one of the rarest murders of all is a murder committed in the course of a kidnapping. Now in this case, McKay was taken from his home by someone he knew, someone who had lured McKay's parents out of their home to get them out of the way. So how did McKay know this killer and what was the motive behind this inconceivable betrayal? It's just stunning to me that he was able to lure the parents away or willing to do that. I've never heard of a case like this before. No, it's uh, pretty convoluted. It is, and very evil. (laughs) Very. The beer for today is called the Jabberwocky, brewed by Lone Pint Brewery in Magnolia, Texas. This is an imperial IPA. It's 8.2% alcohol by volume. It's an orange color, small off-white head. Nice aroma, sweet malt, orange, little pine. Sorry, Jill. And it has a good taste, caramel, orange, and pine. Nice hoppy, somewhat bitter finish. Pretty good beer. All right, let's open it up. Now, I've never tried it before, but I'm going to try it even though there's pine. But as a backup, I have my Delirium Noel, which is a delicious beer for this time of the year. It is. And yeah. It's uh, certainly quite different from uh, the Jabberwocky. So, good well, yeah. backup. And it's great for a car bomb. Do you think everyone knows what a car bomb is? I think everybody knows kind of what the idea is. They might not recognize that name. Depth charge is another term for it. Okay. Just a beer in a shot. Yeah. So, you take a shot of the Baileys made with almond milk. And you drop it into your half-filled glass of Delirium Noel. And then you just drink it, like chug it down real quick. And it's delicious. Don't forget the regimen that you have to do after you finish the beer. (laughs) Yes. Which is wiping your face on the shoulder of the person next to you. Well, the other day I wanted to wipe my mouth on your shirt and you wouldn't let me. So I Uh, had to use a towel. I knew what you were up to. Well, it's part of the tradition, right? Well, you've already changed it a little because (laughs) most people would do a shot of whatever into a Guinness. Oh, right. Well, if I had Guinness, I would have done it. But I didn't have any in the house. Oh, well. But anyway, I'd recommend it for anyone who wants to try it. Just do it at a time where you're not going to be going anywhere for a couple of hours, obviously. Right. Yeah. Do it in the privacy of your own home. Exactly. All right, head on down here to the quiet end and get us started. Okay. So we're going to talk about the Everett family. Paulette, the mother, was the oldest of six children in her family. She grew up in a small Mississippi town. And from a young age, she dreamed of leaving Mississippi, having a career, and a family. After she graduated high school, her younger sister Patsy introduced her to a friend of her boyfriend, and that was Carl, Carl Everett. Paulette and Carl became sweethearts and married in 1971. Then in 1977, Paulette and Carl graduated from Mississippi State University. They both graduated with master's degrees. Carl's was in forestry, and Paulette's was in education. Carl was offered a job in Huntsville, Texas, and they moved to Conroe in 1978. Conroe was close to the forestry plant where Carl worked, and certainly close to the city of Houston. Yeah, but I guess Carl wasn't crazy about his new job, and one of the reasons was there were a lot of snakes. So when (laughs) he'd go out there, he was terrified of snakes, and not only were they on the ground, but they could fall from the tree on you. So he wasn't at all, you know, happy with that, which I understand. 
Yeah, I would too, but he must have figured that that was something that could happen. Yes, he did. But then he took a position at Amoco, a Houston-based oil company. This was in 1979. And at this time, the petroleum industry was really booming. The oil industry gave the Everett's a chance to accumulate some real wealth, and they bought a nice starter home. So Samuel McKay Everett, who would go by McKay, was born in March of 1983. He was a beautiful, bright-eyed baby and a very active toddler. As a school-aged child, he learned to skateboard, rollerblade, and ride a bike. And as an only child, he was really used to being around adults and felt comfortable talking with them. So maybe a little bit precocious. Probably. Those only kids sometimes do that stuff. Yeah, especially if they're bright and they get a lot of attention, which he definitely did. Yeah, he did. So Carl and Paulette, they're hard workers. They developed their own oil and gas company and financially did very well. Paulette, who had been teaching elementary school, left teaching to manage the company's office. And they moved into their house on Pine Springs Court in 1990, when McKay was eight years old. Woods that separated the neighborhood houses were used by the children, and paths were created where they could walk to each other's homes. They even built small bridges over the streams. So it really sounds ideal, doesn't it? It does. I mean, you're in the suburbs, booming city of Houston's close by. There's plenty of stuff to do in your home area. Mm -hmm. It sounds nice. Yep. Now, the Everett's new house on Pine Springs Court was surrounded by three acres of woods. It was a two-story, southern-style home with very lush landscaping. And to Paulette, it was the idea of the perfect home to raise a child. The yard had plenty of space for playing, and the neighbors were all friendly. The house was far enough from the street that it gave sufficient privacy, but it wasn't secluded like a cabin in the woods. There were many things nearby and most of the neighbors were young families. The parents knew one another, and the kids played together. In the summers, they even had block parties, so it really felt like a safe space. Now, after their move to this bigger house, the Everett's still kept in touch with their neighbors from the old neighborhood, and one of those old neighbors was the Crawford family. So Hilton and Connie Crawford, they were high school sweethearts who married after he was discharged from the Marines. Hilton worked as a police officer and was a Jefferson County Sheriff's deputy until 1975. 1976, he campaigned for sheriff. There is a rumor that his campaign was financed by the mafia. Interesting. Yes. But Crawford fought back, raising allegations against his incumbent opponent. He spent more money than anyone else in the county that year. However, the incumbent won and mm -hmm. continued to be sheriff for many years. So then the Crawfords moved to Conroe, where he started a private security company. Hilton was mostly known as a family man, a good guy. He had two sons, and he coached Little League Baseball. He was really good with other people's children, too, treating them like they were his own. But, let's do the butt part here, kid. <laughs> but there was another side to Hilton Crawford, clearly. He liked to dress in expensive clothes and flashy jewelry, he liked to drive fancy cars, but he couldn't necessarily afford all of those things. As a manager of his small private security company with a wife who was working as a school teacher, he really seemed to be living beyond his means. So they weren't as financially successful as the Everett's. Not even close. And Hilton had a lot of secrets. Well, and the, the problem with somebody who likes expensive clothes and jewelry and fancy cars if you don't have the income, but you still are buying those things or renting them, money's got to come from someplace. Exactly. It leads to problems. It sure does. So when the Everett's and the Crawfords became friends, they went out to dinner together and they visited each other's houses. The Crawfords invited the Everett's to go with them to Las Vegas, where Hilton had connections in hotels that gave them complimentary rooms. Hilton went to Las Vegas and Atlantic City several times a year, and he seemed like a real high roller. After taking a few trips with Hilton to Atlantic City, though, Carl told Paulette that he was becoming uncomfortable with Hilton's behavior and with some of his gambling friends. So he stopped going on trips with Hilton. But the two men did remain friends. The families remained friendly as well. 
Yeah, as McKay got older, he would go over to the Crawfords' house and swim in their pool. And he also played video games with Hilton's son, Kevin. McKay became close enough to Hilton and Connie that he began to call them Aunt Connie and Uncle Hilty. And for McKay, the Crawfords were like family. His own biological aunts and uncles lived back in Mississippi, and he rarely saw any of them. Now, that must have been a choice of the parents, wouldn't you think? Well, they moved from Mississippi to Texas. Yeah, but it's not that far from Texas to Mississippi. No, there were visits, but they weren't around all the time like the Crawfords were. Certainly, yeah. So that's different. You might see them two or three times a year. But, you know, when you're raising kids and you're busy working, it's hard to travel that often, even if it's not super far. But Carl and Hilton eventually did go into business together. In 1985, Carl sold Hilton and one of his friends an interest in an oil well. So this was a high-risk venture which turned out badly, and Hilton lost almost $10,000. Wow, I bet he could ill afford to do that. Oh yeah, I'm sure it's money he didn't even have. Then Hilton offered Carl a chance to invest in a new restaurant. But before Carl could become a partner, Hilton told him that he needed a copy of his financial statements. Carl gave him this information, which showed that the Everett's were worth several million dollars by that time. So the Texas oil business had really changed their lives, and Hilton had been left behind. Ultimately, Carl decided not to become involved in the restaurant, which ended up failing anyway. So he definitely had better business sense than Hilton did. But the thing about this is, having those documents gave Hilton Crawford insight into Carl and Paulette's wealth which will come to play in the crime. Yes, it will. Then in early 1993, the Everett's were invited by a neighbor to invest in Amway. Carl was intrigued and got involved during his spare time. And after hearing about it from the Everett's, Connie and Hilton Crawford got involved too. In February of 1995, Carl asked Paulette to host a makeup party in an Amway member's home. So Paulette called several friends, including Connie Crawford, and asked him to attend the party. When she called Connie, Hilton answered the phone. Paulette knew that Hilton placed many of his bets over the phone, so she made a small joke about that, but Hilton answered seriously, telling her that he didn't gamble anymore because it was bad for his health. Yeah, maybe the people that loaned you money are gonna break your knees if you don't pay. It seriously, I think that those types of things were threatened, sure. When Paulette told Carl what Hilton had said, they decided that he must have gotten himself into some trouble over his gambling debts. And Paulette asked Carl, maybe it'd be a good idea to avoid Hilton for a while. Yeah, because Hilton was actually in more than a little trouble. He owed hundreds of thousands to bookies all around the Houston area. And they were pressuring him to pay up or face some serious consequences. Yes. So he was desperate to get out of these debts and really had no one left he could turn to for help. He'd kind of burned all his bridges. That's a tough situation. Yes, it really, I'm sure it is. It's scary to me, and most people wouldn't get themselves into it. So Paulette did notice at the makeup party that Connie Crawford seemed kind of out of sorts. As the other women were chatting and buying the products, Connie didn't buy one thing. Now, of course, buying products is not required, but it did seem odd to Paulette that Connie had left without even buying a small thing. Seemed like there was a serious issue going on, perhaps financial. Perhaps. So over the summer, McKay prepared to play football in his upcoming school year. In late August, Carl took McKay to the Crawford's house where Hilton and McKay tossed a football around and then played some basketball in the Crawford's driveway. The garage door was up and Carl noticed a fancy looking emblem on the rear end of a gold car parked in the garage. So that would also become significant later on. And that's September 1995. McKay started the seventh grade at Pete Junior High in Conroe. On the 12th, there was an Amway meeting scheduled for eight o'clock and the Everett's planned to attend. Hilton Crawford called Carl on the 3rd of September to make sure that they were going to be there, and they told him that they were. Then Hilton called again on the 12th, the day of the meeting, around 4.30 to confirm their plans, and they said, yes, we still plan to be there. It was a school night, so McKay was going to stay home and do his homework. 
McKay had stayed home alone before for short periods of time. It was a safe neighborhood, and the house had a security system. And he's 12. You know, when you're 12, you don't want a babysitter. No. He was responsible enough, generally, yeah. yes. Yeah, and they're going to be in the neighborhood. Yeah, and what does happen could not be predicted. No, no. way. No. Nope. So the day before the Amway meeting on September 11th, the Everett's had a typical morning. Carl and Paulette were awake by 6.30 a.m., and McKay was up by 7. As they ate breakfast together, the main topic of their conversation was football. McKay was going to play in his first game after school, and Carl was just beaming with pride. It was a big deal. McKay was really not a very athletic boy, but he was really trying his best. So before driving McKay to school, Carl took a picture of his son. With his backpack swung over one shoulder, he's smiling and showing off his braces. Paulette picked up McKay after school. They ate dinner with Paulette's mother, who was visiting town to help out with Paulette's brother's newborn. So she did have a brother that had moved to Texas, apparently. Right. And he had a baby. Yes. Now, the football game that evening went well, and McKay was proud to have been on the field for one play. So Carl drove McKay to school the next morning, September 12th, and Paulette picked him up afterwards, as usual. Paulette took him out for frozen yogurt before he started his homework. On this day, he had a fun homework assignment to write a paper about how he could spend a million dollars. Paulette typed the paper as McKay dictated it to her. So you can see he really got a lot of attention from his parents. Yeah, got his mom acting as a stenographer here. Yeah, her life in many ways revolved around him. Oh, sure. So Carl and Paulette had to be at the Amway meeting by 8 p.m. As a typical 12-year-old, McKay was vehemently opposed to a babysitter. He wanted to be independent and was capable of taking care of himself. Also, the house had that security system, and the meeting was very close by. He'd stayed at home alone before, and he had always been responsible and safe. When the call had come in from Hilton Crawford at 4.30 p.m., Paulette confirmed their intentions to be at the meeting. Then, at around 5, Hilton and Connie Crawford drove to her sister's house for dinner. The couple left at around 6.30 p.m. in the same car. Carl had been in Houston for work, so he would meet Paulette at the meeting. Paulette and a neighbor and a family friend, Randy Bartlett, would ride there together. The Amway meeting was in a building in downtown Conroe, just about 10 minutes away from the Everett's house, depending on traffic. I think it was like five, six miles. So as Paulette and Randy were leaving the Everett house, McKay was sitting in the den eating ice cream straight from the carton. Paulette reminded him to keep the phone and a flashlight near him in case the mild rainstorm that was going on then made them lose power. McKay turned on the security system when his mother left the house. He was really more tech-savvy than his parents and knew more about the system than they did. And he'd been taught not to open the door for strangers, and Paulette trusted that he would never break that rule. So Paulette and Randy arrived at the meeting around 8.15 and met up with Carl. It was raining. Paulette told Randy that it made her nervous for McKay to be home alone in a storm. But Randy and Carl assured her that McKay would be fine. When the meeting ended at 10, the Everett's and several other people decided to go for coffee at a local restaurant. Eight of them met at a coffee shop, making small talk, and at some point Carl got up and called home from a payphone, but McKay didn't answer. So he's a little worried, and he told Paulette that he was going to go home to check on McKay. So a short time later, Paulette and Randy got ready to leave. They said goodbye to the others and walked towards Paulette's car. It was right around 11 o'clock by that time. And while they were still in the parking lot, Randy told Paulette that he had just spoken to Carl, and Carl had told him that McKay was not at the house, and he couldn't find him. Carl had also told Randy that the back door had been ajar, and the alarm had been shut off. So that's so, very concerning. That's a huge concern. That's a problem, yeah. And when she heard this news, Paulette immediately felt that something bad had happened to her son. As Randy drove them home, she actually crouched down on the floorboard and just screamed in terror and disbelief. So she didn't have any false ideas that everything was fine and he'd run off. She knew him better. She was terrified right away. Well, yeah. I mean, there's some things that you can't answer just yet, but just the fact that this responsible kid wasn't there 
and the back door was ajar, mm -hmm. that would be hugely concerning. Yes, absolutely. So Carl searched the house for McKay. Sometime between 11.15 and 11.30, the phone rang, and Carl answered, hoping to hear his son's voice. But it was a woman who was on the phone. In a raspy voice, she asked, Who is this? <laughs> Carl answered that he was Carl Everett. And the caller said, We have your son. We got him. Then she demanded $500,000 ransom in $100 bills. She said she would call again the next day, which was Wednesday, September 13th, at 8 a.m., and would give instructions about where to leave the money and where to find McKay. So after hanging up, Carl immediately called 911. This ransom call had confirmed that McKay had not run off, but had been kidnapped. Paulette and Randy showed up just minutes later, and there were already people in the front yard. Paulette was looking for Carl and just trying to convince herself that McKay may have gone out joyriding with some neighbor kids, but deep down she knew he just would never do that. He knew the rules, and he would never leave the house without letting them know. So she went into the house, sat in a rocking chair, and just cried and cried. As the police searched the house, Carl called Hilton Crawford. With his law enforcement and security experience, he might be able to help, Carl thought. It was about 11.40 p.m. when he called the Crawford house, and Connie answered. Carl told Connie about McKay's disappearance and asked if he could talk to Hilton. But Hilton wasn't at home. Carl asked Connie for Hilton's cell phone number, but she said she didn't know where he was and she didn't know his cell phone number either. Come on. I know. There's something fishy about Connie. And even if you don't know it, you have a number stored in your cell phone. Yeah, this is the late 90s, so not everyone had a cell phone. No, it wasn't as common as it is now. Well, Hilton had a cell phone. Yes, but I think it was mostly for business. But yeah. anyway, I think you're right. She had uh, to know it or have it somewhere. She, I agree with you there. Yeah, I mean, that just seems like uh, very fishy to me. It sure does. So there's some neighbors across the street named the Cons, and they took Paulette to their house. Bill Connor told the police that while taking out the trash earlier in the evening, he had seen a gold late model Chrysler backing out of the Everett's driveway. He also reported that the car had almost hit the trash can on his lawn near the street. As the car sped away, Bill noted that the car was a four-door model and it had an emblem that read Crown Motors on the left trunk area. He had gotten a good look at the exterior of the car, but the windows were tinted and he couldn't see anything inside. But that's solid information. I mean, at some point, this car goes tearing down the driveway and takes off and the kid's missing from the household. Yes, absolutely. And then the expected Wednesday morning call from the kidnappers never came. The FBI had tapped the phones and were prepared for additional calls. The FBI also asked the Everett's to make three lists. One was for people McKay trusted. Another was for people McKay loved. And the third was for anyone that McKay respected. So they knew that McKay would not have opened the door for a stranger. So everyone that the Everett's knew were potential suspects. Paulette and Carl made the lists. They knew that whoever had taken McKay would have to have a key to the house, know about the alarm system, or know about their plans that night. McKay would not have left willingly with a stranger, the house had not been broken into, and the door wasn't damaged at all. So they knew that McKay had to have left willingly with someone that he knew. So that's a big deal for information. It is. It seems fairly easy to narrow down that field of possibilities. Yeah, it really narrows it down quite a bit. So the Everett household was turned into the FBI's command center. Carl's office was a meeting room. And there was another upstairs room that was used to perform polygraph tests. People came and went all day long, leaving food and offering their support to the parents. On the morning of September 13th, this is the day after, the morning after, Carl remembered the emblem that Bill Conn had reported seeing on the car that left the Everett house on the night of the abduction. 
he told Paulette that he had seen that same emblem three weeks earlier on Hilton Crawford's gold car. Bingo. And he reported this to the FBI. Yes, yeah, so Carl was the first to be polygraphed, and he was eliminated as a suspect. Next, a family friend named Rick Metz was polygraphed. The Everett's had met Rick at church, and he was a single man in his 30s who lived with his parents. Well, that's a suspicious thing. Yeah, it kind of matches a certain profile. But Rick had been hired to watch their dogs and cats when they were out of town, and he had also babysat McKay when he was younger. He did have a key to the Everett house, and his name was on all three of those lists. So he was someone who McKay would have opened the door for. And, coincidentally, he had a sister with a raspy voice. But Rick passed the exam, and he would be cleared as a suspect. Then the next day, Thursday the 14th, FBI agents asked the Everett's not to go public with the news of their son's kidnapping, out of fear that McKay might be harmed. But the media began to arrive out front, and the yellow tape around the property was a dead giveaway that something was very wrong there. So a joint news conference was held by the FBI and the Montgomery County Sheriff's Department. And that afternoon, Hilton Crawford gave consent for the FBI to impound and search his 1994 gold Chrysler. When the trunk was opened, agents noticed that the lining had recently been removed. So how's that for a red flag? A huh, big one. Also, the dealership emblem on the trunk had been removed. Crawford told agents that he left Conroe on September 12th at 8.10 p.m. and drove to Lufkin, Texas to meet an employee, Karen, who was an employee of the Security Guard Services, the company that Hilton worked for. He said that he had left Lufkin at around 9.30 p.m. and then driven to Jasper, Texas. He left Jasper at around 11.30 p.m., he said, and drove to Beaumont, Texas, arriving at 1 a.m., and there he checked into a Best Western Motel at 1.30 a.m. So is he saying this was like a business trip? Yeah, it was it, kind of vague, though, to be honest with you. It sounds vague. Yes. Well, his business could be very vague. So the FBI was also focused on those three lists that had been drawn up and of the description of a gold car. They told the Everett's that they wanted to question Hilton Crawford, but he had refused to take a polygraph because of his high blood pressure. But at this point, Crawford's moving up on everyone's suspect list. And I don't even understand the high blood pressure excuse. That doesn't seem to be any valid ex no. excuse at all, other than buying you some time. Well, yeah, it's like saying, you know, you're not going to release your tax records because there's an audit. It's just a way to put things off. Yeah. Yeah. So then the Everett household continued to have visitors. One of the visitors was Jeremy, who worked at a local car dealership. Now, he spoke with Carl and Paulette in their home, in their kitchen, and mentioned that Hilton Crawford had recently ordered a new mat for his trunk. This information was passed on to the FBI. Investigators knew that Crawford owned a gold-colored car, which matched Bill Kahn's description, and Crawford was on all three of the Everett's list of people McKay had trusted, loved, and respected. Carl and Paulette both believed that McKay would open the door for his Uncle Hilty. So when the FBI looked into Crawford's cell phone records, they learned that he had contacted several employees of the security business that he managed. When the employees were interviewed, they told agents that Crawford had asked for their help in making up an alibi. So a 55-year-old woman named Irene Flores had been called by Crawford a total of six times that night. So he had called Flores at 7.55 p.m. for one minute and 15 seconds. Then at 8.11 p.m. he called her again, and this call lasted 28 seconds. The third call at 8.37 p.m. lasted two minutes and 29 seconds. Then Crawford called Flores from Lake Charles, Louisiana, at 11.10 p.m. and they talked for two minutes. Then he called her again at 11.13 p.m. for three minutes and at 11.30 for six minutes. So there's definitely something up there. It's a lot of phone calls. It is. A lot of short phone calls like you're passing on information, right? Yes. Yeah. So Flores was interviewed and arrested after she confessed to being the person making the ransom call. She said she had known Crawford for about 10 years, 
and had worked for him back in the 1980s. She told investigators that Crawford had called her at work in early September and asked her if she wanted to make some money. Crawford told her that she just had to make one phone call and he would pay her $30,000. So listen, if someone's offering you that much money to do something simple, you know it's wrong. You there's, know you're gonna... there's something that's not right there. Yes, because yeah. if it was a simple phone call, he would make it himself. One phone call, 30 grand. But she knew that it was something really hinky because she was asking for a ransom. Yeah, he told her to call Carl Everett and tell him that McKay had been abducted and she needed to ask for $500,000 in $100 bills. Crawford had told her to use a payphone. So she had a friend drive her to a payphone where she called the Everett house dozens of times before Carl finally answered. So Irene Flores was a crucial link in connecting Hilton Crawford to McKay's abduction. On the morning of Friday, September 15th, Crawford was arrested. Some crime. Three days after it occurs, he's under arrest. Yes, he made a lot of mistakes. Yeah. So that afternoon, he was officially charged with aggravated kidnapping. So Crawford was in jail. But the problem is McKay is still missing and investigators and the Everett's believed that he was still alive. Because why wouldn't you think that? This is like a middle-class friend of the family. Yeah, I, I guess if you're convinced that uh, Hilton was involved in the kidnapping, mm -hmm. then you'd hope that he was still alive. I would think so. I think you'd be hopeful. Because otherwise, I wouldn't be very hopeful. No, no, not at all. Crawford told his jailers that he had made a bad mistake. And he told them that he told someone named Remington to put the kid on a bus and that he hoped the boy was all right. He said that his mind had been a little clouded, but now he was remembering more. He said that he took McKay to Lafayette, Louisiana, and a guy named Remington met him there. He said Remington drove a burgundy-colored Cadillac, and he took McKay to New Orleans. If the deal worked out, Remington was supposed to put the boy on a bus and send him back home. Boy, that's some story, too. Yeah, okay. he'd been cooking that up while he was sitting in jail, it seems clear. On Saturday the 16th, Carl asked Paulette to go to see Connie Crawford and ask her to go to the jail to get Hilton to draw a map showing where McKay was. So Paulette had a friend drive her to Connie's sister's house where Connie was staying. And when she heard that Paulette was outside standing in the driveway, she ran out screaming hysterically. She screamed over and over that McKay was dead. She said she knew Hilton had hired a hitman and that the police had found blood on his car mats. Yes, I'm not really clear on what Connie knew and when, but to me it seems like maybe she knew a little bit about the plot but did not expect a murder to be part of it. Yeah, I guess from the way she's acting, that'd be one interpretation. Yeah. So Connie and Paulette went into Connie's house, and when Connie had calmed down a bit, she started talking about their financial problems and Hilton's gambling problem. Paulette then asked her to go to the jail and ask Hilton to draw a map so investigators could find McKay. So there was a news conference at 12.30 p.m. that was held on the Everett's front lawn. Carl held a football, and he spoke into the camera, addressing Crawford. In jail, a TV had been placed just outside of Crawford's cell so he could watch this. So Carl said, I just want you to search down real deep in your heart. Whatever did happen, I hope your heart will just soften and understand that all we want is McKay to be back home and safe. In my heart, I know that you would never harm my son. You gave him this ball. He called you Uncle Hilty. He loved you dearly. Three weeks ago, we were at your home playing with this ball, and when we got ready to leave, I said, give your Uncle Hilty a hug, and McKay came over and hugged you and kissed you on your forehead. So that's heartbreaking. It is, and it seemed to have worked. I mean, Crawford might have been moved by Carl's words, or maybe he just saw that he had no way out. But he did draw a map that led investigators to McKay. McKay had been murdered, and his decomposing body was found September 17th near a highway about 15 miles from Lafayette, Louisiana. 
This is about a four-hour drive from Conroe. The area was called Whiskey Bay. It has a large swamp where a body could be hidden quite easily. So after McKay's body was found, Carl and Paulette were just living their worst nightmare. They'd lost their only child to unthinkable violence by someone they had all known and trusted. Yeah, to me, that would be a really difficult thing. Oh, this, my this God. Is a, a good friend, a family friend. Yeah, a father himself. Yeah. It's just unbelievable, really. McKay's autopsy would show that he had been beaten on his head, likely with a metal flashlight. He had also been shot at least twice with a forty five caliber handgun. Crawford confessed to the kidnapping, and he even admitted to being there when the boy was killed. But he continued to blame the murder on an associate he called R. L. Remington. The gun was recovered, as was the trunk liner and Crawford's clothing, which had been cleaned at a local dry cleaner. The dry cleaner said that the clothes were stained even after the cleaning. Finally, on September 20th, Crawford did agree to take a polygraph. He answered yes to being at Whiskey Bay with McKay when he was shot, yes to owning the gun, and yes to seeing someone named R.L. Remington shoot the boy, and yes to four people being there when the boy was shot. But there was deception noted in the fourth and fifth questions about Remington and four people being there. A grand jury reviewed the evidence and indicted Crawford for capital murder. So this put him in danger of getting a death sentence. And this wasn't just some remote danger. This was happening all across the state. Texas had executed 19 people in 1995 alone. And between 1982 and 1994, Texas executed 85 capital murder convicts. But Crawford planned to tell a jury that he did not kill McKay. He admitted to assisting in the abduction and faking an alibi, but he said he was not the type of person who could kill a child. So beside the idea that he's saying he didn't do it, it wouldn't really matter because he was there and it was during a felony being done. Right. So he's guilty either way, although it doesn't seem very believable that this Remington person was there. No, if he even exists. Exactly. So Crawford's attorneys filed a motion with the court to get bail set for him. Crawford initially had private attorneys, but he was broke, really broke, and his case was turned over to a public defender. But in a death penalty trial, the defense lawyers are very skilled and experienced. His attorneys asked for bail between $15,000 and $20,000. Prosecutor requested bail be set at $2.5 million. A little bit of difference there. Ultimately, bail was set at $1 million which Hilton couldn't pay, so he remained in jail. Right. Investigators soon ruled out any third-party involvement, too, in McKay's murder. No one named R.L. Remington was found, and Hilton Crawford is believed to have acted alone. His attorneys worked to get a change of venue, citing the extensive media coverage since McKay had gone missing. All pretrial hearings were held without media present, and a gag order was put in place. But prosecutors objected to the gag order, stating that restricting the media from covering the case was a violation of the First Amendment. So in December, the gag order was modified to restrict only attorneys and witnesses from speaking publicly about the case. The defense wasn't really happy with this, arguing that continued media attention interfered with Crawford's ability to get a fair trial. But his trial was scheduled for March 18, 1996. The judge did relocate the trial because of the defense team's argument that the pretrial publicity was potentially prejudicial. The trial was moved to the Criminal Justice Center on the Sam Houston State University campus in Huntsville, Texas. Now, even after the trial was moved, the prospective juror pool had also been exposed to the Houston media coverage on the case. The new trial's county, Walker County, was also where the state prison was located and many people who worked for the prison would be part of the jury pool. And it was also a very conservative county, and was the site of the execution chamber. Ooh. So in some ways, having a trial in Walker County was worse than staying in Conroe. I guess so. I think either way, there's just so much evidence he's done for. He probably is. The crime was just so hideous that it was well known throughout all of Texas and Louisiana, and even quite a bit around the country. 
So in early 1996, Crawford was able to get his bail lowered to $450,000. But it made no difference, he still couldn't afford to pay it, and he remained in jail. The trial was postponed until June, and Crawford's attorneys filed a motion to suppress videotaped statements made by Hilton to the police. But the judge ruled against him, noting that Crawford's statements were given voluntarily and were not at all coerced. He'd been read his rights, and he had willingly spoken with investigators. So jury selection began in June, and the trial was again postponed, this time until July. The judge set one final pretrial hearing for attorneys from both sides to raise any issues remaining before the trial began. Crawford's defense brought up the insanity defense, but that was quickly denied. And then after whittling, the jury pulled down from 500 prospective jurors. Eight women and four men were seated as jurors. There were two female alternates. One day, both Paulette and Crawford entered the courtroom at the same time, and Paulette sat in the front row of the public seating area. They were close together. Crawford leaned toward her and whispered, Fuck you. Can Paul you imagine? No, I can't. <laughs> Jeez, so he's really Paul not feeling very bad about this. Doesn't seem like that, does it? No. But apparently Paulette handled it very well, smiling and saying something like, and good morning to you too. But she was shocked by his hate and anger with her. Well, yeah, where does that even come from? Well, if they had just forked over a half a million dollars. They never even got instructions where to put it. That's what I don't understand. Why would he kill the boy when they hadn't even tried to get the money yet? That's true. Unless it's because the police came or... Maybe he hurt the boy and then accidentally ended up injuring him so badly that he felt he needed to kill him. I don't know. It could be. But something really messed up happened. Well, and maybe he had, besides these business plans or business dealings that, that the two men had, maybe Crawford had approached Everett asking for money for a loan so he could pay off some of his debts and was refused. Well, that's possible, and I think he definitely had some resentment against the Everett's, especially after they moved into that large house and he found out how much money they had. Yeah. I think he did resent them, and maybe that was some of the deep rage he had. Because according to Paulette, his face was so filled with rage that she couldn't help but wonder what her son McKay had seen on the man's face in his last minutes. Maybe Hilton Crawford had a really deep hate for all of them. He could. It's possible. Yeah. So Monday, July 8th, the jurors were sworn in. And the first thing that happened was that the state read the indictment against Hilton Crawford. It summarized how Crawford had kidnapped McKay and intentionally caused his death by striking him with an object and shooting him. Hilton pleaded not guilty. Then the prosecution made their opening statement. Yeah, the statement laid out what would be brought forward as evidence and focused on how Crawford had been a longtime family friend who had betrayed the trust of McKay and his parents. The jury was told about the Amway meeting, how McKay had called him Uncle Hilty, the security system, the phone calls that were made to confirm that Carl and Paulette would be out of the house that night, and the condition of McKay's body when he was finally recovered. Now, the first witness called by the prosecution was the most emotional one, and that was Paulette Everett. The DA started by showing her a photo of McKay and asking her to identify him. And she answered, that's my baby. She was asked about Connie and Hilton, and she told the jury that the Crawfords came to see McKay after he was born and that Hilton had held him. She explained that they were so close that McKay called them Uncle Hilty and Aunt Connie. Yeah, Paulette was questioned about the events leading up to that Amway meeting on September 12th and she testified that she had received a call around 5 p.m. from Hilton Crawford, and he was checking to see if she and Carl still planned on attending that Amway meeting. She also testified that he had called and checked the same thing one week earlier. He had told her that he would see them at the meeting, but of course he had never shown up to it. Paulette said that the meeting ended at around 10 p.m. and that they had gone to a nearby restaurant with several others. To tell her version of the worst day of her life, Paulette had to relive this trauma. The cross-examination by the defense had her describe how close the Everett's and the Crawfords were. 
but nothing exculpatory was brought forward at all. A school friend of McKay's, a young lady named Elizabeth, testified about McKay calling her about 8.30 p.m. on September 12th. This would be when he was home alone while his parents were at the Amway meeting. Yeah, his mom had left about 8, so he'd been alone for about a half an hour then. So Elizabeth testified that during the call, she had put the phone down for a moment as she exchanged some magazines with a friend who stopped by her house. After she returned to talking with McKay, he told her to hold on, and she heard him put down the phone and open the door. Then she heard a call waiting beep and clicked over to talk. Then when she clicked back to McKay, he wasn't there, so she hung up. She tried calling him again about 15 minutes later, but the line was busy. She gave up trying to call him back, and she ended up going to bed at 10.30. She lived actually right next door to the Crawfords, and she had seen McKay at the Crawford home before. Now, Bill Kahn, the neighbor who lived across the street from the Everett's, testified about seeing the gold car when he was taking out his trash cans at about 8.30 p.m. He had seen the car both entering the Everett's driveway and leaving it. He knew that it was a Chrysler that was a gold color and that it had an emblem on the left side of the trunk. He also testified that the tinted windows had prevented him from seeing who was inside. He estimated that there'd been just three or four minutes between the car's arrival and departure. So it had all happened quite quickly. Bill Kahn also testified that law enforcement had taken him on September 14th to a local auto dealer to see if he could identify a car like the one he had seen on the 12th. He was able to identify a Chrysler AHS. Then he was taken to the FBI office and shown a car. He identified this car as the one that he had seen at the Everett's house. Except that this car was missing the Crown Motors emblem and a Crown sticker. You could see where they had been removed. The defense tried to damage his testimony by suggesting that it was too dark and that he'd been too far away to identify the car. But Khan held fast to his story. Pretty damaging. Very damaging. So Carl Everett testified about his family's relationship with the Crawfords. He testified about them being friends. They saw each other several times a year. He talked about their visit to the Crawfords just a couple of weeks before the abduction. Then when asked about the events of September 12th, he confirmed the testimony of Paulette and Randy. He also told the court that McKay was very experienced with their home security system, and he would never have opened the door for a stranger. But he certainly would open it for his Uncle Hilty. The defense asked Carl about the ransom call, and he was asked if he had ever received another call. So again, the defense didn't have anything to help their case. The 911 operator who had spoken to Carl testified and confirmed his story and the timeline. Yeah, a deputy from the Montgomery County Sheriff's Department, Thomas Taylor, testified about something that had happened back in August of 1994, so about a year before the abduction. He was dispatched to the Everett house to respond to an alarm, and he said that he approached the back door, parked his car, and rang the doorbell. He said that McKay came to the door and shook his head. Now Taylor was in uniform, and he asked McKay to open the door but McKay shook his head no. He asked McKay if everything was okay, and McKay said yes, but the point of this testimony was clear. McKay had refused to open the door even for a uniformed officer with a marked car in the view as well. Yeah, but he is a stranger, so exactly. don't let him in. So that proves that he wasn't going to open the door for anyone he didn't know. An official from the Houston Cellular Company testified with information on Hilton Crawford's cell phone calls that had been made on September 12th. He testified that four calls were made from the Lake Charles, Louisiana area. His phone records showed many calls placed from locations between Conroe and Lake Charles on the evening of the 12th. Crawford's whereabouts were being connected by these records. Now, the defense did try to create doubt with these facts but the testimony and chain of evidence were clear. I don't think there was a lot the defense could do here. No. No, it really wasn't a winning case. I think they're more 
focused on him just not getting the death penalty is the most they can hope for. I think that's the correct call on that. Yeah. Now, Billy Allen, a friend of Hilton Crawford, testified that Crawford had tried to call him on September 13th at around 7.30 a.m. and that Connie had answered the home phone. Connie gave Billy a number where Hilton could be reached, but he didn't know if it was a cell phone or a pager number. But the point here was that Carl had testified to calling the Crawford house on the night of the kidnapping and that Connie had told him that she did not have a contact number for Hilton. Yeah, but she did for this guy. Right. So something amiss there. Well, she's covering up. Okay. According to Billy Allen, around 9 o'clock in the morning of the 13th, he was talking with a friend named Gary when Crawford drove up in his gold Chrysler. Hilton asked Allen if he could put some things in a storage room. Then Crawford told him a story about how he was concerned because he had allowed a guard, not licensed to carry a firearm, carry his gun on a job. The guard had caught someone breaking into the building he was guarding, and the guy shot at the guard, nicking him in the arm. Then the burglar had gotten away. Crawford said the guard was not seriously hurt, but that if anyone found out about the gun, he could lose his license. So Crawford told Allen that he made the guard get into his trunk so he wouldn't get blood in his car, and he drove the guard to his parents' house. Well, this is quite a story, this which I don't fan believe. Fantastical story. Right. Billy Allen said that Crawford drove his car between a couple of storage sheds and started taking stuff out of his car, because Billy Allen owned a storage business. Allen had given Hilton a screwdriver so that he could remove the bloody liner from his trunk. And Alan had seen the liner and noted three or four blood stains about the size of silver dollars. He saw Crawford using cleaner on these spots. And he saw Crawford remove a bag, some other items, and a gun from his trunk. Then Crawford gave Alan the gun. Billy Allen testified that Crawford said he had to get back home and gave him a bottle of champagne wrapped in a kitchen towel. He had thrown the trunk liner into a fire to get rid of it, not knowing that it was evidence of a murder. The defense questioned Allen about the time sequence and the bottle of champagne. He said that he didn't think much about the champagne because Crawford had given champagne to him and his wife before. But that was some good information. It sure was. Then an FBI agent testified that on September 15th, he picked up Billy Allen at his home and drove him to the storage sheds. Allen unlocked shed number 124, and they looked into a green garbage bag that Crawford had left there. In the bag, they found a Smith & Wesson 45 caliber pistol that was fully loaded. And there were blood stains on the hammer and the trigger guard. So what's going on here? Um, besides this horrible betrayal, there's just such sloppiness. So many people he kind of involved and talked to, and then not even wiping down the gun? He is a textbook of how not to commit a murder. Yeah, so you have to wonder, was he just so frantic with the debts he owed? Was he on something? I don't know. Could have been. Yeah. Another FBI agent testified about logging in 36 pieces of evidence from that storage shed on Billy Allen's property. And the gun was traced to a gun purchased by Hilton Crawford at a sporting goods store back in 1988. It's getting better and better for old Hilton. There's so much evidence. Alan's friend Gary, who had been with Alan that morning, testified that between 8.15 and 8.30, Crawford pulled up in his car a gold Chrysler. He described Crawford as acting strangely, just didn't seem like his normal self. Paula Trull, the office manager for a Chrysler Plymouth dealership in Houston, testified that Connie Crawford had purchased a Chrysler AHS there in 1994. She also said that the car had a crown symbol on the trunk, on cross-examination, the defense got her to admit that she had not seen the actual car purchased by Connie. So a, a small, actually very small victory for the defense. Super small. Now more testimony about Crawford's car was given from Billy Wisham, an auto service consultant at Demontrand Auto Country in Conroe. Wisham logged in auto information from customers who brought cars into the dealership for service. She testified that she knew Hilton Crawford because he brought his Chrysler there for service. On September 13th, according to Wisham, 
Crawford called it about lunchtime. She said that he wanted to replace his trunk mat because it was wet. He told her that the car was a lease and he wanted a new mat before he turned it back in. And she told him she'd get him a price. She also said that Crawford wanted her to remember that he had thrown the original mat away. Then he said that he would call back later. The defense asked Wisham what kind of customer Crawford had been, and she said that he was a good customer who always tipped her. So again, a very small victory. Yes, very. Now, Jeremy Sweeney, who worked in the parts department at the auto dealership, testified that an unknown caller had called around at 1.30 p.m. and asked him how to remove an emblem from a car. The caller said it was a Crown Motors emblem. Sweeney said that he told the caller to use a chemical called a cryosol. He said that the caller sounded like an older man, but he didn't know who it was. Gail Vos, a security guard whose supervisor was Crawford, worked at the Louisiana Pacific plant in Lufkin. And he testified that Crawford rarely came by the plant, but that he did bring the employee paychecks by. He said that Crawford called him back on September 14th at around 11 a.m., and told him about McKay's kidnapping. Then he said that investigators were looking at vehicles similar to his. Then Crawford told him that he had been at the Lufkin plant Tuesday evening the 12th at around 8 p.m. observing the security guards. Then he asked Vos if he had been on duty that night. Vos had not been working there on the 12th, but Crawford had asked him anyway if he would verify that Crawford had been at the plant that night. Vos testified that he said he couldn't state that Crawford was there if he didn't see him there, and that Crawford then had told him that he understood, and he hung up. Oh, there goes that alibi. There's so many people, though, that he talked to. And another security guard, Karen D., testified that she had agreed to an FBI request to record any phone conversations that she might receive. The FBI told her about McKay's kidnapping, and suggested that someone might call her to try and use her as an alibi witness. She testified that on the evening of September 14th, she got a call from Hilton Crawford. She talked to him, and he asked her if she could do him a favor. He said that if anyone called wanting to know if he had been there on the 12th, to tell them he had been at the plant until about 9.15. Now, during this call, he told her about the kidnapping. Remember, this conversation was recorded and she told Crawford that the FBI had contacted her and that they were coming to talk to her. Crawford hung up. Well, the president of the security company that Crawford managed testified that Crawford had high blood pressure and was very worried about his financial situation in August and September of 1995. He had filed for bankruptcy and was in a very bad situation. An employee of One Price Cleaners in Conroe testified that while at work on September 13th, Hilton Crawford brought in a shirt and a pair of pants. The clothing felt like they were salty and sticky, and they were very dirty. At the time Crawford came in, he was non-communicative, and his eyes were puffy. Another employee from the cleaners testified that she had opened the bag labeled Crawford and dumped the clothing out on the counter. She said they were sticky and wet, the clothes were cleaned and hung up, but the shirt still had what looked like a blood stain on the front of it. Robert Lee, an FBI agent, testified about how Crawford had told him that he waited on a security guard employee at his house to go with him to the 8 p.m. Amway meeting on the 12th. The employee never showed up, he said, so he decided to leave Conroe on business. Crawford told the agent that he left his house at 8.10 p.m., and drove to Lufkin to meet a guard at the Louisiana Pacific plant. He said that he met with the guard for a short time and left around 9. Lee testified that he and another agent had asked Crawford to provide contact information for the people he allegedly had met, but Crawford had been evasive. Now, FBI agent Diaz was present on September 14th when Crawford's car was examined at the Conroe FBI office. He testified about seeing the weather stripping on the lip of the rim of the trunk was depressed and indented. It looked like something had been pried in between the top of the trunk and the weather stripping. And it had been done from inside of the trunk, as if someone was attempting to get out. Huh, huh. 
Now, Paulette knew there would be testimony about her son being in the trunk, but it was really devastating to hear that he had been fighting for his life, basically trying to claw his way out. The courtroom had to be cleared at that moment so that Paulette and her mother could compose themselves. Then Guy Williams, sheriff of Montgomery County, testified that on the morning of September 16th, Crawford, who was held in the Montgomery County Jail, told him that McKay Everett was dead. He said that Crawford was upset and shaking at the time. Then he drew a map and told officers where they would find the boy's body. Two officers had found McKay's remains in the high weeds in the early morning of September 17th. They testified to the condition of his body and the area. They testified about a drag path indicating that someone had dragged McKay's body to the place in the weeds and left him there. He'd been wearing a shirt, but it was pushed up to his chest. So it was apparent that McKay had been unconscious or dead when he was dragged to the spot by his legs or his feet. Then after searching the area for three days using a metal detector, two forty-five shell casings were found. A firearms examiner with the Montgomery County Sheriff's Department testified that the two shells, plus a spent bullet later found deep in the soil at Whiskey Bay, were from a forty-five pistol. He tested Crawford's forty-five and compared the shell markings from Crawford's gun on those found at the murder scene. He told the jury that the little markings on the bullet are unique, much like fingerprints. Marks from the firing cartridges from the firing pin were also very unique identifiers. He concluded that the spent cartridges and the bullet had been fired from the same gun that Billy Allen had seen with the items that Crawford had stored at his storage business. And the coroner testified that McKay's body had a bullet wound in the right back region of his head. And there were other injuries to his skull over his right temple and his left eye socket. The gunshot would have caused almost instantaneous death, but the injury to his right temple could also have caused his death because bone had been pushed into brain tissue. So the cause of death was listed as gunshot and or blunt trauma to the back of the head. So I just wondered, did he hit him with the flashlight trying to knock him out? but actually injured him more than he thought and then decided to shoot him? Possibly. Well, we're never really going to know because he never really admitted to doing the shooting. No, he's held fast to the Remington theory. Yeah, and I just feel like he could not bring himself to admit that he had done such a horrible thing. Yeah. So DNA experts testified that samples of blood from Crawford's clothes, the gun, and inside the car's trunk had come from McKay Everett. The probability that Carl and Paulette Everett were the parents of the donor of the blood stains was 99.9%. Now, the defense tried to suggest that 99.9 was not 100%. The well, forensic, it's true. It's true. <laughs> and the forensic identity expert agreed, but it testified that the percentage made no difference. Also true. Yeah. McKay's blood was identified from Crawford's shirt and the inside of his trunk. And this was beyond reasonable doubt. Yeah, Hilton Crawford did not fit the profile of someone who would abduct and kill a child. And that's part of what was so shocking about this case. The psychological and social research done on criminals all suggest that crime is an activity of young men. Actually, felons in our society are mostly males under 30 years old coming from inner city areas. Now, you could say that part of that is that they don't have the resources that other people might have, but most have not graduated from high school and have very poor work records, and many have a history of substance abuse. So in many ways, Crawford was an anomaly. He had no history of drug or alcohol addiction, he was educated, and he was not a psychopath. He was an older white man with a job, a nice home with a pool, a decent income, and a family who seemed to love him. So how had he ended up killing a child who he knew well, and then showing no remorse for his horrible actions? What had driven him to kidnap and murder, and why had he believed that he could get away with it? Now remember, he was a former police officer and a security so-called expert, so he should have known that he was going to be caught. Well, the way he did it, yeah. Yeah. And he... He should have planned it differently. Well, we don't want to talk about how he could get away with it, right? No, I'm not going to. No. I'm just, I'm just saying that it was a, a poorly thought out and poorly executed plan. Exactly. You're right. Yep. 
Now, although it's not necessary to provide a motive in a murder trial, the prosecutor wanted to provide one to the jury. So Joe Duhon trained racehorses in Shreveport, Louisiana, and he had known Hilton Crawford for over 20 years. He was the next person to testify. Duhon actually trained a horse owned by Crawford. The horse raced at Louisiana Downs in Bossier City, which is the same track where Hilton claimed he had met R. L. Remington in 1993. Duhon testified that Hilton had not been paying his horse training fees, and he owed Duhon about $4,000. Prosecutor asked Duhon how Crawford was going to get the money to pay him, and Duhon told the court about a phone conversation the two had had. In this conversation, Crawford had said that if he couldn't get the money, he would kill himself or kill somebody else. And I think he'd meant it. Well, apparently. Yeah, I think he was extremely desperate. And of course, you know, he's not going to kill himself. He's going to kill an innocent child instead. Another horse track friend of Crawford, Jay Heron, told the court that a few weeks before McKay's disappearance, Crawford had offered him $80,000 to babysit a kid for a few days in a kidnapping scheme where the kid would not be hurt and would be returned to his parents. Now, wisely, Heron turned him down. Heron's testimony showed the jury that Crawford had believed that he could kidnap a child, collect a ransom, and then just, you know, return the kid and play golf like nothing had ever even happened, which makes no sense. None. It doesn't. No. Then after Heron's testimony, real estate agent Marty Spiller testified that Crawford had gone to his real estate office prior to the kidnapping and asked about houses for sale. Spiller said that Crawford had been very interested in a house listed for $290,000. Now in the 90s, that's a lot of money for a house. He even discussed installing a wet bar in the home. So that shows that he had plans to entertain in the new home after getting the money for it from a child's ransom. Well, he's still going to have money left over after he pays off his debts. But can I, you really believe he was going to return him? Because the boy no. would have known it was him. He's not going to, no reason at all to return him. Well, it doesn't make any sense. If he returned him, he would clearly get caught. So you have yeah. to wonder, was he just planning on murdering this boy from the beginning? Which is just, it's really unimaginable. It is. So the jury had heard about how Crawford was going to profit from the kidnapping and murder of a 12-year-old boy who he had known since birth. He had even calculated how he was going to spend the money. That's Yikes. really evil. That's really horrific. So it's believed that Crawford came up with this plan to kidnap McKay Everett at around the time of his bankruptcy, which was in May of 1995. The first evidence of his plan came from a written statement made by a security guard who had worked for Crawford. He wrote about a conversation he had with Crawford in August of 1995. So on or about August 15th, he had a conversation with Crawford about how long it took a dead body to begin to give off an odor. So this is like a month before it happened, so here's more evidence that he had planned to kill the child. After the guard said that rigor mortis enters the body within 24 hours and leaves within 48, Crawford asked him how long it would take for a body to put off an odor if it was in inside the trunk of a car. When the guard answered that it would depend on the weather, Crawford asked him, what if it's hot weather and the body's inside the trunk of a car? The guard answered three to four days. Now apparently Crawford had approached this guard with these questions because he knew that the guard used to work in the funeral home business for over 20 years. Huh. Getting an expert. Yeah, but how can you think none of this is ever going to come out? I don't know how he could even think any it's of that. delusional, yeah. Now, Crawford had expressed his intent to testify, but when it came time to do so, he declined. And actually, the defense rested without calling any witness. In closing, they stated that the prosecution had not clearly established how McKay had been taken or exactly how he had been killed. They also suggested that R. L. Remington, the mysterious hitman, was still out there but they were resigned to the fact that he would be found guilty. After reviewing the evidence and the testimony, the jury easily found Hilton Crawford guilty beyond a reasonable doubt.
Yeah, it only took an hour for the jury to return with the guilty verdict. Yeah, that's astounding. It is. So there's no doubt about his guilt, but then the second phase of the trial was to determine his punishment. It was an important decision to be made by the jury, but the state of Texas has legal guidance to help them make their decision. So the jurors needed to answer two questions. Was there a probability that the defendant would commit criminal acts of violence that would constitute a continuing threat to society? And did the defendant actually cause the death of the victim? Or did he not cause the death, but intended to kill the deceased or another, or anticipate that a human life would be taken? So it's worded very confusingly. It is. Yeah. Now, if the jury unanimously agreed that the answer to both of the questions was yes, Crawford would get the death sentence. Question number two had been determined in the guilt-innocence phase. So the only real question was whether he was a continuing threat to society. But, you know, he really was the worst of the worst, a convicted child killer who had betrayed his family and his friends. So the jury really didn't seem to have any problem sentencing Crawford to death. And then the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals affirmed his conviction and sentence in February 1999 and all his subsequent appeals in state and federal court were denied as well. So he's on death row. He was, yes. And on death row, the other inmates called Crawford old man. In an interview, he explained how he had become so desperate to kidnap the child of family friends. He said that he had sold a security firm and was waiting for the proceeds, but the buyers sold the business to a second group and his plans fell apart. The new owners... Nigerians, according to Crawford, ignored their debts owed to Crawford and didn't pay the employees. These had been my people, so I decided to pay them myself, he said. Jeez, what a guy. Yeah. And then after doing that, he found he was $450,000 in debt. I guess I could have gone to family for help. I could have struggled. I should have, but I didn't. Yeah, right. Well, he's lying about that whole thing. Of course he is. He didn't own that company. Yeah, I don't know about the, the details of that, but yeah, it's bullshit. And this whole thing about Nigerians and him paying his people, don't yeah. buy it for a second. So he went on. He went on. I made a wrong decision in my life. I really messed up by being involved. I really am sorry. But he still stuck to the story that R.L. Remington was the one who actually had killed McKay. Yeah, according to Crawford, he met Remington at the racetrack, and Remington told him that he'd done this before and no one would get hurt. He said that he waited in his car while Remington abducted McKay. But when Irene Flores failed to make any follow-up phone calls with ransom instructions, Remington shot McKay. Most people familiar with the case believe that Remington was a made-up person completely. Paulette told an interviewer, I think R.L. Remington is his pistol, and it was his way to disassociate himself from what he did. I agree. Crawford never wavered from his account. I know where Remington is, he told a reporter. He's in France. I've got an address. Then he added, it will all be made clear in information to be released after I die. But of course, it never was. Now, Irene Flores, the former employee of Crawford's, was supposed to be paid $30,000 from him for making the ransom phone calls, said that she never thought McKay would be harmed. She pleaded no contest to aggravated kidnapping and was sentenced to 25 years in prison. In 2018, she was paroled. So she got a pretty good punishment. She did. Which she should have. She was in jail. She knew it was a kidnapping. For over 20 years. Yeah. Yeah, she knew what was going on. She did. There's no excuse. Now, after the murder, Paulette Everett, her health was not good, and she ended up having a stroke. She and Carl divorced, and she remarried. Carl Everett kept a low profile, but Paulette started the McKay Foundation to raise awareness for child safety. The greatest thing I can contribute is the story of what happened and hope people can look at me and hear my story and have an awareness, she once told a reporter. You know, I, I would like to know in situations like this, how many times uh, the parents end up being divorced. The, I would imagine it's a lot. How can yeah, you? I mean, it seems like such a strain. And it's their only child, so their lives are never the same. Right. I was thinking that it's a pretty high number. Yes, I agree. I think it is. So Hilton Crawford was executed July 2nd, 2003, 
by lethal injection. At his execution, he thanked his family, friends, and spiritual advisors who supported him. He also thanked the Lord Jesus Christ for the years I have spent on death row. They have been a blessing in my life. Then turning his head toward Paulette, he said, I want to ask Paulette for forgiveness from your heart. One day I hope you will. It is a tragedy for my family and your family. I am sorry. He is pronounced dead at 6.19 p.m. Yeah, so as I've said before, I'm not a big supporter of the death penalty. I think it's just too much of a risk that innocent people will be killed. Plus, I don't know if I really believe that killing someone in any way makes it any better that they had killed someone. But that's a big question that a lot of us have to think about. That's for sure. Yeah. So TCB's music was produced by Mike McClellan. You can find out more about his work by going to his website, podcastps.com. And if you have comments, a case suggestion, or a beer recommendation, you can send us an email to truecrimebrewery at tiegrabber.com or leave us a voicemail. There's a direct link in our show notes that you can click on and you can record your voicemail for a future show. So you can do that on your phone, your PC, whatever. It's very easy to do and we love to hear from our listeners. And if you're asking yourself, how can I support True Crime Brewery? How can I get in on all this? and get myself some bonus episodes and episodes without ads. Well, we figured that out for you. We have our True Crime Brewery premium option where you get your own personal URL to add to your podcast app. And you can subscribe to our show completely free of advertisements, plus get at least one special members-only episode each and every month. And in addition to that, we send a gift and some swag and a handwritten thank you note. Members also have the option of listening to our ad-free episodes on our website or on Patreon. It's time for listener feedback. So what have we got for feedback, Dickie? So we've got a couple of voicemails and a couple more updates on some cases. And the voicemails first, we're going to hear Bex commenting on a recent episode. And Bex also had a question to ask us. Well, we've heard from Bex many times, so we have. she's a friend of the show. Let's hear what she had to say. Hey guys, it's Bex. I was listening to the Jewelry Store episode and I had to pause it because my mouth was on the floor when you were talking about rheumatoid arthritis stick. Many people do not understand that there's multiple kinds of arthritis and I actually have rheumatoid arthritis. So, I mean, oh my gosh, it really hit home for me. So if you don't mind, I just will tell you a few things. I started having symptoms when I was two years old and I was diagnosed when I was about two and a half. And when I was little, um, this was the 70s. So like with him, the main treatment was aspirin. So for me, it was baby aspirin. So I had to take four baby aspirin like four times a day and even in the middle of the night. So it was not bad, but I ended up with terrible, terrible stomach aches, very painful. And not until I was in mid to late high school in the early 90s, did my doctor put me on anything else? So I had methotrexate. I had prednisone. Um, I'm now on a biological response modifier, which people may have heard of, Enbrel, which has totally changed my experience. But yeah, back in the 70s, just as you said, it could be very disabling. And when my mom found out the diagnosis, she was just terrified that I would be severely disabled. So we are very grateful that I'm able to, you know, have a healthy, you know, regular life and I'm a teacher and all that. So yeah, it was just so interesting. I just had to call in. I just couldn't believe that connection. But with that being said, thank you for explaining it so well. I did have a question for you guys. So if you ever feel like answering this, it's just a curiosity. If either of you could have any unsolved case solved, which case would it be? I'm very curious to hear. 
All right. Thanks, guys. Talk to you later. Bye. Well, thank you, Bex. And thank you so much for sharing that. That's kind of personal stuff, but I think it's a really a great way to educate the public. I think when a lot of people think of arthritis, they think of older people. Oh, they do. They don't realize what a serious condition it can be. And thank goodness it's more treatable now. Yeah, I have one of my golfing buddies with rheumatoid arthritis who's had it for years. And he's been on Embrel a few years now and thinks it's the most wonderful drug that ever got created. Wow. It's really helped him. And it sounds like it's helped Bex tremendously also. Yeah, that's great. I'm really happy about that because she seems like a super sweet person. Besides just loving True Crime Brewery, I think she's a good person. <laughs> <laughs> so in response to her question, yes, I would like to have, uh, just because it's close to home, the uh, bowling alley murders that occurred in Las Cruces, what, 20 some years ago? A yeah, a long back. time ago. And it was a terrible crime. Multiple there murders. Were seven people murdered and the suspect has never been apprehended. And I don't think they even have any idea. Right? There was one of the um, retired police at your golf course. Yeah, no, they, they don't have any idea at all. Yeah. No, I think they have suspicions, but yes. nothing, nothing that's going to be worthwhile. I so. think that's a good one. I think most of them that I would like to have solved are ones where we know who did it, but they just never got convicted. That's, that's something that I find really disturbing. But yeah, I think the bowling alley would be a really interesting one to have solved. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, actually, one just popped into my head. It's the murder of Beverly Lynn Smith, which was in 1974. Now, Beverly was just 22 years old. She was married and had a baby. And she was shot in the back of her head at about 8 p.m. on an evening when her husband was working at a GM plant in Reglan, Canada. So this case really had a handful of suspects, but what's absolutely fascinating to me is that this case had a Mr. Big investigation. You know, we've covered those, and those are just crazy. They're illegal in the U.S. And this led to the arrest of a neighbor of Beverly's, a guy named Alan, and they did this Mr. Big setup on him and got a confession, and his wife was involved in all this, and a friend of hers, just fascinating. So this Alan was arrested, and he's now believed to be completely innocent. But if you're not familiar with this case, I really recommend watching the docuseries. I believe it's on Prime. It's called The Unsolved Murder of Beverly Lynn Smith, and it just came out earlier this year. It's only like three or four episodes, so it's not a big time investment. But that's a case that I definitely would like to do an episode on, and I would love for it to be solved. I'm not sure if they're still trying to solve it. I believe they are. It was reopened um, in 2008-2009. So I think that would be uh, great if that could be solved. The second voicemail is from Aaron, and he's going to talk about beer. Okay, well, that'll lighten the mood a bit. Hey! This is Aaron Avery. I uh, actually am a brewer for two breweries in East North Carolina. I listen to your guys' podcast on Pandora uh, while I brew beer almost every day. All I want to say is keep up the good work, and if you like, I'll send you some of my brews. I don't have a story recommendation or anything like that, but yeah, tell me what you're interested in, and I will send it. Now, who can resist that? So, Aaron, I'll be sending you an email. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, Aaron. I think it's pretty cool that he listens to us while he's brewing beer. Oh, absolutely. What better way to brew beer than to listen to a crime story? Right. Exactly. I know. And then, well, I'm just always kind of blown away that anyone listens to us, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Not to insult us at all. It's just that, you know, we're two regular people. Yes, we are. But, you know. People listen, which is great, of course. We'd be nowhere without that. So I think, yeah, why don't we come up with a, another North Carolina case? Those seem fairly easy to come by. Yeah. No offense to North Carolina, but they do have their fair share of crimes. Well, I'll see if we can get Aaron to send a beer or two over. Yeah. And uh, we'll get a North Carolina case and feature his beer. Yeah, that would be wonderful. Help us and him. Okay, it's a deal. Okay. So instead of putting any of our emails in, 
I see that today Dick wanted to talk about some updates that people have been asking us about. Well, some we cases this, we covered before. Yeah, we did this not too long ago, giving some updates, and I thought that... Uh, we did it just last time, last oh, episode. I guess it wasn't too long We ago. talked about that Casey Anthony atrocity. Yeah. And what else? Oh, and the Delphi, the Delphi situation. Murders. So, I thought I had a couple other things. One is evolving, so we'll probably do a an episode on that once everything is settled. Okay. But the other one is just an update. It's uh, on the Lynette Dawson case. Yeah, this is an episode that we covered on March 10th, 2020. We had to take it down once the trial was about to begin, or maybe we didn't have to, but we agreed to. And then we reposted it after the trial and the sentencing were done, which was very recent. Yeah, I think it wasn't demanding that we take it down, but it was... It was a request by the defense team, I believe, that we got. Yeah. yeah. And we took it down. We did. We're cooperative. We knew he was going to be convicted anyway, honestly. I did. I felt pretty certain. So just a quick review, Lynette Dawson disappeared from her New South Wales home in January of 1982. She was planning a beach outing with her mother. Her husband, Chris, was a suspect because he didn't report Lynette missing for six weeks and because he had quickly moved his teenage girlfriend into the family home. So the case went cold and it was reopened in 2015 with new evidence. Chris was arrested in December 2018 and charged with the murder of Lynette. He was ordered to stand trial in 2019 and the trial began in May of 2022. And this was a judge alone trial, no jury. And it was Judge Ian Harrison presiding. So the trial lasted 10 weeks and Judge Harrison found him guilty. He was sentenced to 24 years in prison. 18 years, kind of mandatory, and then he's eligible for parole after 18 years. So that's like 40 years ago, right? Like, yeah. Like, yeah. Okay. That is like 40 years ago. Wow. Okay. And then, Dickie, you were doing some research recently. A lot of people have been talking about and asking about the recent murder of college kids in Idaho. So Dix looked into this, and he's going to share a little update for those of you who aren't updated, although I'm suspicious yeah. a lot of our listeners know a lot about it. I would wager that probably <laughs> most of our listeners are up on this and have as much information as I have. Yeah, but for the ones who don't, including me, let's go over it. But just to recap things, this uh, started on November 13th, 2022. Four University of Idaho students were killed in their sleep in an off-campus home. Three of the dead, Madison Mogan, Kaylee Goncalves, and Zana Canoodle, lived at the house. The fourth person dead, Ethan Chapin, was Canoodle's boyfriend and he was sleeping over. Those two had been at a fraternity party and they had gotten back to the house around 1.45 in the morning. Mogan and Goncalves had been at a local bar and then stopped at a food truck on their way home and they got in at 1.56 a.m. They then made 10 unanswered phone calls to a former boyfriend of Goncalves. He didn't answer. Then there were two other roommates. They arrived home at 1 a.m. They were in their beds on the first floor and did not hear anything. A 911 call was made from the house at 11.58 a.m. requesting help for an unconscious person. So what do you think those two roommates think if they slept through it? You'd have to have some survivor's guilt, wouldn't I, you? I would think. That would be difficult to deal with. They were on the first floor. The murders were on the second and third floor, so... That's why they think it was directed at someone that lived up there. Yeah. Yeah. So, I read that the murders have been investigated by about 130 people from three different agencies, and there have been at least 15,000 tips. Autopsy results showed all four victims had been stabbed multiple times with a large knife. One of the girls, Goncalves, had more severe wounds that led to the speculation that she had been targeted by the killer. Right, yeah. A lot of talk about that. On December 15th, about a month after the killings, people are starting to get a little frustrated that nothing's happened. Police announced they were looking for a white Hyundai Elantra that had been seen in the area of the murders at about the time the murders had taken place. An ownership of the Hyundai was traced to a local man who was planning to drive it to Pennsylvania with his father for the holidays. There was also DNA recovered at the scene that did not belong to any of the victims. So with the help of a public genealogy database, 
23 and Me or one of those types of things. Yeah, one of the ones where people try and find out their history. But using that, investigators found a partial match to an individual with a familial connection to that DNA that had been left behind. Now, I think that's remarkable. We've heard of that type of technology solving cold cases, but this kicked in right away, like yeah, within a well, month of the murders. That's pretty impressive. DNA is DNA. Well, sure. But to use that kind of... Uh, well, they had already gone through CODIS. Right. And there was no match there. So then they, they looked at the uh, genealogy databases. Yeah, but I feel like they did that pretty quickly. They did. And there was a lot of pressure on them as well. Well, on December 30th, four days ago, something like that. A few days ago, yeah. 28-year-old Brian Koberger of Albrightsville, Pennsylvania, was arrested. He was charged with four counts of murder and one count of burglary. He is expected to waive extradition. According to his court-appointed public defender, he is eager to return to Idaho uh, and prove his innocence. Oh, sure. So Koberger got an associate's degree in psychology in 2018, and then he received a BA in 2020 and a master's degree in 2022 in criminal justice from DeSales University. That's a school in Pennsylvania. And he was pursuing a PhD in that same field from Washington State University. So that's how he ended up in that area, because yeah. WSU's, what, like 10 miles from the University of Idaho? About 10 miles. Very close. Okay. Yeah. So I know there's more to come. So there must be some overlap in partying and going to the bars and stuff between the two universities, well, if yeah, they're that they're, close they're together. close by. Yeah. So we'll find out. But it looks like he'll be extradited back to Idaho and will be charged and go to trial. Well, I find it interesting that he was studying criminology. I'm sure I'm not the only person that feels that way. No, I think that's something. And from someone with that much education, it really isn't very uh, well-executed crime. <laughs> Leaving DNA, having your car there. So it makes you wonder, was it really in a rage? Was this someone who was not really thinking? You might think, although with all the witnesses and cameras, security cameras and stuff, yeah. car shouldn't have been there. But stabbing somebody with a knife, very common to injure yourself. Right. And then your blood gets mixed in. Right. Sure. Well, that's what I mean. It doesn't seem very well thought out. So, of course, there's so many rumors. Maybe he was stalking one of the girls. We don't know. Yeah. So we'll stay tuned for that. And when we hear more, maybe we'll just throw it into our feedback section. We can do that or we can do an episode one of these days. Yeah, one of these days. I normally like to wait till the trial and all to do an entire episode. Oh, yeah. That's what I want. Well, that might be a while because it doesn't seem like he's going to plead guilty or take a plea, although that's always a possibility. That's right. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thanks, Dickie. That was really interesting. I think you should keep doing that when you hear from people who want information on a more recent crime or some kind of update. Will that's do. fascinating to talk about. So let's say goodbye to our folks at The Quiet End. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you next time at The Quiet End. Bye-bye. Bye, guys.